uh, we recognise there's a crisis. This winter's NHS crisis. The NHS is in trouble, we all know that, whether it be doctors, nurses or paramedics striking, the increased A&E waiting times, difficulties getting a GP appointment, we know there's a lot going on and in this video we're going to be taking a deep dive to find out more about the factors that have contributed to this NHS winter crisis that we're all currently facing. So the first point that I want to talk about is the short appointment times and you might have witnessed this yourself when you go to GP and you're only given a 10 minute appointment and this isn't because the GP doesn't want to speak to you or doesn't care about your issues it's simply because they cannot afford to spend more time on one individual patient. In today's world where demand for healthcare is rapidly increasing supply unfortunately remains consistently low whether that be in terms of the actual number of doctors or healthcare professionals we have within the NHS or in terms of investment investment in funding or in terms of appointment times. Now the consequence of shorter appointment times is that the doctor may not always be able to paint a full and detailed picture of what the patient's presenting symptom or presenting complaint is. They may not be able to ask all of the questions that they wanted to and may not be able to gather all the key information they need in order to come up with a treatment plan. In fact, 37% of doctors believe that they prescribed the wrong course of treatment because of short appointment times. This might mean that the patient has to keep revisiting the GP surgery and has to keep making more appointments so that the doctor can get to the bottom of the issue. And in the end, the patient ends up spending more time than they ever would have if they just had a couple of extra minutes in their first ever appointment. Additionally, because of short appointments, patients may choose not to disclose all of their symptoms or all of their issues to doctors. And this means that the decision of what symptom and what issue is relevant and not is left to the patient. And the patient may not always know what is medically relevant. For example, as a patient, you might think if you've been losing weight, that's a good thing. You've been eating healthy or you've been exercising. However, for a doctor, if you've been losing too much weight, that actually might be a sign of cancer. And so when patients are choosing what is relevant, and what isn't, doctors might miss out on extremely relevant medical symptoms that they otherwise wouldn't have missed out on if they had longer appointments. And lastly, because of shorter appointment times, if doctors end up misdiagnosing their patients, their actual condition might continue to develop and become even more serious. And in the end, the patient may have to present to A&E or hospitals and secondary care. And this is so much worse for the patient's health, but also for the NHS, both in terms of cost and time. Within the winter months, the NHS sees an influx in the number of patients who are coming in quite unwell. Unfortunately, there are just not enough beds for everyone who needs to be admitted, nor is there enough staff to maintain the high level of beds that patients desperately need. Over the last 10 years, 25,000 beds have been lost in the NHS, and as a result, there are extremely long waiting times to see a doctor and very, very long times in A&E for any sort of response. Now, there is a delay in the time taken for you to be seen in A&E itself, but once you're admitted in A&E, there are many news articles and reports of patients who are waiting weeks to be admitted onto the right ward. For example, there are articles of patients who are waiting for a bed in the psych psychiatry unit and are waiting in A&E instead. And this is a highly inappropriate environment for them to be managed in. And as a result, it's compromising patient safety, increasing the workload on all healthcare staff involved. And it's a very difficult thing for an individual to go through. Patients are distressed, patients are going through difficulty and are not being managed in an appropriate way as a result of the bed shortages. Those are patients within the hospital themselves, but patients who are unable to get into hospital or unable to be admitted, that's that makes the, the situation even more complex. And the bed shortages are incredibly damaging, not just for healthcare staff who want to be able to help these patients, but for patients who are vulnerable and have nowhere else to go and seek the support that they require. The NHS is facing potentially a massive exodus of doctors leaving the NHS. In particular, a recent survey amongst consultants showed that 44% of consultants uh, planned on either taking a break or actually leaving the NHS within the next year. And similarly, polls have shown that actually approximately 20,000 doctors are leaving the NHS per year and just under 20,000 doctors are actually joining the NHS with around 20,000 vacancies within the NHS. What it therefore means is that there's a huge reliance on locum doctors 
um, that are paid a greater amount than usual regular doctors. And what this actually means is that in the long run, the NHS ends up paying much more for these locum doctors that could have been potentially avoided had they actually given all the normal working doctors a pay rise. Of course, this is something that's not just exclusive to doctors. We're also seeing this with nurses with around 40,000 vacancies for nurses. What this means is we're getting staff that are overstretched and overworked in an increasingly demanding healthcare system. One of the biggest factors that has resulted in the NHS being in crisis at the moment is reduced funding. Now, even though funding has increased bit by bit, year on year, this just hasn't kept up with inflation. So while the costs of the NHS are rising exponentially, funding just isn't keeping up. This, along with the economic crisis that we're in at the moment, Brexit and the COVID pandemic, means that we simply don't have enough funding to keep the NHS afloat. How does this impact us? Well, we pay our healthcare professionals less and we cannot afford quality healthcare. This might mean that we can't afford quality healthcare products, technology or treatments simply because there isn't enough funding. Additionally, overworked and underpaid healthcare professionals simply can't provide quality healthcare to their patients. So a lack of funding overall just means reduced patient safety, which is not something that the NHS wants. At the moment, all funding is just being used to keep the NHS barely afloat, when in fact our goal should be to have enough funding to not just keep the NHS afloat and continue to manage the patients that we have, but a significant amount of money should also be spent on research, researching cures to incurable illnesses, researching new cancer drugs and so on, which just isn't happening at the moment. So we really do need an increase in NHS funding to be able to not just pay our healthcare professionals more, but to increase our patient safety standards. Some things that NHS workers are going through currently are things like losing morale during the winter time. This is something that's really, really um, important in the NHS because with, when staff don't have the ability to self-motivate to work, it takes away from the staff system and people don't work as well together. Um, people can get more upset over small things and patients ultimately don't get the best care that they could have. So the staffing shortages and the lack of morale in the staff network is something that's really detrimental to patient care. So I think that one thing that could be facing the NHS, not only in the coming months of winter, but well into 2023, could be that of privatisation. There's been a significant amount of change within uh, politics with the new prime minister and the new government and cabinet as a result. And that all inevitably leads to a change of health secretary and changes to the NHS as well. Now, with uh, changes to taxation and to public sector spending, we could see the NHS affected by this sooner rather than later. Um, and one of the ways in which this could impact the NHS is that of privatisation. Uh, we could see more services and uh, departments within the NHS um, outsourced um, to private companies, um, which could inevitably lead to a vast change in the way the service is run. Another point that I want to talk about is the bottleneck for spaces. And this means that there's fewer specialist roles than trainee positions. Now, for example, you want to become a neurosurgeon one day and you're in training, so you're a registrar and you've completed all of your training. So 10 years worth of training, medical school and so on. And now that it's time for you to be a consultant, there just isn't a spot open, which means you have to stay as a registrar until a spot opens up. Now, that also means that you will have to continue to do registrar duties instead of consultant duties, even though you are as trained as a consultant and you have the skills required to be a consultant. Now, obviously, this severely reduces worker morale because you've put in the time, you have the skills and you cannot practice as the specialist that you want. And that was your ultimate goal. However, it also negatively impacts patient care, and that's because we have such few specialist positions and all of the pressure goes on them, even though there's so many other individuals with the same skill set and with the same abilities amongst whom the workload can be distributed. Imagine how much more productive the NHS would be if all registrars who have completed their training actually find consultant positions. We would be able to do so many more surgeries in one day and ultimately just be more productive. Additionally, workers who feel like they aren't working at their skill level and aren't being challenged enough usually burn out much quicker and are much more dissatisfied with their role. And ultimately, this might result in them leaving their job. So because of this losing staff morale, 
and potentially um, not having people able to work. Patients experience longer wait lists and times for treatment procedures, diagnostic procedures, getting medication prescribed to them, and making sure that their medications are optimized. So all of these things can really have a detrimental effect on patient care and can really shorten some patients' treatment options because catching things early may be able to give them more options, but if we don't have the ability to catch things early because things are getting pushed back, NHS doctors won't be able to treat their patients as well as they should be. One of the things that the NHS is really facing this winter, in my opinion, is that of a poor vaccine uptake. The flu jabs are currently being rolled out, but so far the uptake seems pretty poor, which could leave a lot of vulnerable um, patients open to infection from the flu virus, which kills um, a surprisingly large amount of patients each year. And so really encouraging people to get their vaccines at this state um, in the year can really save some lives uh, a few months down the line. Another factor which complicates the NHS winter crisis is the ageing population. So what is the ageing population? As a result of improved care and quality of treatment, people are living for much, much longer alongside having quite complex medical conditions. And so when these patients come into hospital during these winter times, it becomes very, very difficult and important to manage them in a well-rounded, holistic manner. It's important that in the management of whatever problem that they've come in with, you're not exacerbating or worsening any of the existing conditions. Considering the medications that you're giving them at present is important uh, to ensure that it won't interact or have side effects with any of the other things that they're currently taking. Equally, patients may not have brought all their medications with them and it becomes the duty of the healthcare professionals around them to ensure they're getting their regular treatment for their ongoing medical conditions. And so in this way, it becomes very, very complicated and important to treat the patient in all aspects of their health care as opposed to just the problem that they've come in with. And in that way, it does complicate uh, the way that patients are managed during winter times, as this is not just one patient, but many patients who come in in the same way and need management across the whole of their health care as opposed to the condition that they may be facing at present. Since 2010, the NHS has faced a reducing budget in terms of real terms, not only compared to European countries, but also down to the rising healthcare costs that we're facing. Ultimately, this NHS wins crisis that we're currently facing is something that we're going to be seeing again and again if there isn't long-term planning and a real injection within the NHS to cover staff wages, ward, bed and equipment costs. We're just going to see this happening again and again. And the argument that I would make is actually there's no difference between the health of the economy and the finances of the economy. And indeed, the more that you invest in the health of the economy of the country, the more people are going to be able to work, the more productive everyone's going to be. And ultimately, the happier everyone is going to be as well. OK, so that brings us to the end of the video. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. If you have enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe and leave a like as well. And if you are an Aspire Medic, be sure to check out our online work experience course. It's completely free and it goes through over 15 plus specialties so you can make an informed decision about medicine. All right, guys, see you in the next video.